Today we're talking printing your photos and posing your subjects. Hey guys, and welcome to Flurn. My name is Aaron Nace. You can find me on flurn.com, where we make learning fun. And last week we talked about getting out of that creative rut. We're all creatives, it happens to all of us. Sometimes you're fired up and inspired and you wanna go out and do awesome stuff. And then other times you wanna sit on your couch and do Netflix and uh, basically you're not creative and you don't know what to do. So last week we talked about what we did to get out of a creative rut and I wanna read some of your guys' responses. When I'm in a creative rut, I take a break for a couple of days, sometimes even a couple of weeks until I start missing photography and Photoshop again. For me, whenever I'm in a creative rut, I tend to find new friends or models to work with or just somebody I haven't worked with before to get a fresh take on my possibilities on expanding my skills. What I do is lock away the camera, sit back, relax, and go somewhere really beautiful where you can take it all in and you reach a point where you're just craving your camera once again, absence makes the heart grow fonder. I doodle on a piece of paper and let my mind wander until ideas come to me, or they don't. Sad face. So you can see we all go through creative ruts. That's a totally normal part of the creative process. But if you're in a rut, just keep in mind, it's only gonna get better unless it gets worse, but then it'll get better again, or it just gets worse forever. And on that note, let's get into this week's questions. Being new to photography in general, I'm not sure what things to consider when deciding to print an image. Not sure where to go, online versus a print shop, deciding what to print, image format, resolution, and things like that. So here's the deal with photo printing in general. Chances are the very first print you do is not going to turn out how you want it. You're going to have to do some tweaking before your print actually looks great. Now, if you're printing your photos at home, that's really not that big of an issue. You can continue to make tweaks in Photoshop, send it off to the printer, and just through trial and error, you can wind up getting it right. And then when you know you get it right, say, okay, I need to increase my brightness by 20%, lower my saturation by 10%, and my print is going to turn out perfect. Now, if you're having someone else print your photo, whether it's a lab in your city or someone online, my advice is to work with a reputable printing company that's gonna work with you to make sure that that print actually comes out how you want it. I've had really great experience with Bay Photo and Mpix and White House Custom Color, and there are a lot of other really great printing companies out there, I just haven't worked with them personally. And in the past, when I've received a photo that was not up to spec, like, oh no, this is way too dark or the colors are totally off, oftentimes I've been able to call the company, explain the issue, and they've been able to send me a new print back and make sure everything was done right. Not only that, but if you work with a reputable printing company, they should have a customer service line where you can talk to the experts. They know their machines and you can send off your prints with the exact right specifications so they print correct on their machines. Keep in mind that every single printer is different and has a different color profile. You wanna be sure that you contact the company, find out what machines they're using, make sure you download and install that color profile, and then you should be printing like a pro. And my last piece of advice is don't send off your final large print. Let's say you want to do a 24 by 36 inch print, which is big and beautiful and we all love it. I would recommend getting a smaller print done first and then breaking that smaller print up into multiple prints. Let's say you do an eight by 10, go ahead and save out a few different versions of your photo. Maybe a little bit brighter, a little bit darker, saturated, desaturated, a little bit of reds. Order that first and then you can see with this test sheet that's relatively inexpensive. Okay, you know what? Number three looks the best and then go ahead and pick that file and send that off to have your 24 by 36 done. This way it's gonna save you a bit of time and a bit of money through the printing process. Can you show us how to add perspiration to a person or a thing? Thanks for all the great tips. So perspiration is one of those things where basically you got a bunch of tiny little water droplets and if at all possible, I highly recommend shooting this in camera. Photoshop is really great, but for things like adding realistic water drops, especially like hundreds or thousands of them, man, it's gonna be difficult and it's gonna take you a long time. I know that sometimes you don't have the option. Maybe your client gives you an image and it says, hey, make it look like this person is sweating and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. In that case, of course, you're not in control of the photo shoot, so here's what you can do. My suggestion is to use the clone stamp tool or the healing brush tool and sample an image with a person or an object that already has some perspiration. Be sure to do this on a new layer so you can change the color and the light values to make sure that one skin tone matches another. But do keep in mind that this process is on the tedious side and it's kind of difficult. So don't worry if you don't get it right on your first go. Keep trying. Make sure you use non-destructive editing. For each water droplet, be sure you're creating a new layer and then use clipping masks to color and lighten each of those water droplets to make it fit into the image. Go ahead and look in our description right down below for an episode on how to use clipping masks. 
tasks. And the next time your client sends you a picture and says, can you add sweat to this person? Say, just photograph them with sweat next time. Quit making my job hard. <sighs> and if you are on set, you can just get a spray bottle and use water with a little bit of glycerin in it. Psh, perfect spray sweat. Spray sweat sounds kind of gross. In the last tutorial about removing braces, you successfully painted the colors in, but the teeth lacked texture, which might be a problem in some cases. How would you apply texture to different kinds of objects, not just skin? So when it comes to texture replacement, my suggestion is our good old friend, the healing brush tool. A lot of people know and love the healing brush tool for blemish removal. Basically, you can sample an area of skin that you like and paint over a skin that you don't like and poof, your blemish is gone. And this is gonna be the majority of uses for the healing brush tool, but you can also use it to duplicate textures. You basically use the healing brush tool in the exact same way, but this time with texture in mind. So you're not trying to replace a blemish here. Basically, you're trying to replace the original texture with the texture from wherever you sample. Now you can even bring in a new photo into your document and sample an area on that photo and then paint in wherever you'd like that texture to show up. This technique is relatively easy to do and it allows you to copy texture from basically any photograph. So the next time you need to duplicate texture, don't forget your good old friend, the healing brush tool. Hi, uh, hi. I'd like to know if there's an option to transfer the adjustments I made from one image to another. The answer is yes. And we have a couple of options here. We have an option for both Lightroom and Photoshop. In Lightroom, this is really simple. All you have to do is make your adjustments on your first photo and then hold shift and select other photos in a series. Click on that sync settings icon, go ahead and choose the settings you'd like to sync and hit OK. All the changes you made to your first photo will be ripple applied to the rest of the photos in that series. If you want to transfer your adjustments in Photoshop, make sure you're working non-destructively. You want to be sure you're creating adjustment layers that can be turned on and off. It's really easy to do. Simply go to layer, down to new adjustment layer and choose from the list. So to apply these to a different photo, simply select those adjustment layers and drag them onto your new image and voila, all your adjustments will be available on your new photo. Hey Aaron, I took an image the other night and opened it up in Photoshop and zoomed in. It had tons of tiny bright dots all over the picture. Picture. Is this because of high ISO? Is there any way to fix this in post-production? So what you're experiencing is known as noise and you nailed the nail right on the top of the nail. It is because you're using a high ISO. The higher ISO you use, basically what your camera is doing on the inside of your camera is just a little computer in there. Now, if you have a signal inside your camera, so you got a baseline signal, when you raise your ISO, it basically amplifies that signal. And anytime you amplify a signal, you're going to amplify the lights and the darks, but you're also gonna amplify the noise in that image. And that's what you're seeing in your photo when you zoom in. So all those tiny little dots in your image, they are known as noise. Now, it's not the end of the world. If you're all the way zoomed into your image and you see some dots, well, who else is gonna be all the way zoomed into your image? Probably no one. So if they're not that evident at a normal viewing distance, I wouldn't even worry about it, to be honest but there are some great noise removal tools in Photoshop. In fact, we have a wonderful free tutorial that shows you exactly how to remove that noise. And to view that tutorial, simply click on your screen right now or find it in the description right down below. Click, click. I'm struggling to find my own style of editing. Every time I edit a shoot, it doesn't look the same as a previous. Do you have a tip on how I can create my own editing style so people can also recognize my pictures? So in my opinion, style comes from both your photographic style and your editing style. And I also strongly believe that the way you edit your photos should be influenced by the content of the photos themselves. There are some cases when you wanna do a ton of editing, like on our recent shoot, Gods of the Nile. This was like a stylistic image where I went in and like really enhanced all the color, everyone's retouched, we've got a lot of crazy stuff going on in this image. And then we have other types of photo shoots which are a little bit more natural, like this one I shot of my friend Niall, in which I kept the editing relatively simple because that's what I thought the image needed. So if I would apply each of those different types of editing on the different photos, it would not have worked for the photographs themselves. So rather than trying to force an editing style to fit for every single image that you shoot, if you want a consistent image style, make sure that you shoot consistent images as well. Now, I also noticed that my own photographic style and editing styles tends to change throughout time. Maybe it's summer and I'm all happy and I wanna create like bright, beautiful, happy, fun, colorful images. Other times it's winter and I'm all depressed. I wanna create like moody portraits and those two 
like oftentimes don't really look like they were done by the same photographer, but there will always be underlying themes in those photos because you're the person who took those photos. So rather than trying to apply the same editing style to all your images, I would focus on what you want to say through your images. You can have bright, happy, fun images, and you can have dark, moody photos. That's totally okay. No matter what you do, you're an individual and your unique perspective will show through your photographs. All you have to do is continue taking pictures. And after a period of time, you'll find things that do link those pictures together. Maybe it's the way that you interact with people. Maybe it's the way that you light your subjects. Maybe it's the colors that you're attracted to. Maybe it's your choice to shoot everything super wide angle and close to your subject. Or maybe you want a very shallow depth of field. All these things are choices that you're going to make throughout your photography career. And that's what's gonna wind up defining your style rather than your editing style from photo to photo. Can you offer any tips on posing people who are not necessarily models for portrait photography? So it's my belief that the more comfortable a person is in front of the camera, the better that portrait is going to be. You're gonna get expressions that are natural instead of contrived, and you're gonna get poses that are natural instead of contrived as well. Basically, I would spend all your time and energy just making sure that the person you're working with is comfortable and that has nothing to do with your camera or your lights or your tripod your gear or anything like that if they're cool with you chances are they're going to be relatively natural during the day of the shoot and that's going to show in the photos now as far as posing someone's body there are a few guidelines that are going to help out but keep in mind the person has to be comfortable because if they're uncomfortable it's going to look uncomfortable on the camera as well so let's start from the head and go down generally you want their chin to be up and out a little bit that's just going to help separate their head from their body. You don't want to squish them back in like this. It's going to look a little bit awkward. And as far as their head direction goes, keep it relatively straight on. You know, a portrait like this doesn't really make sense unless the person's got like a question mark look on their face like, what? <laughs> Now also don't feel like the person has to be looking directly at the camera for every single photograph. Oftentimes I'll have subjects look other places, it just tends to look a little bit more natural, especially if someone's not really comfortable staring into the camera. When it comes to shoulders and torso, generally you want a little bit of angle in there. So if I'm just like totally like square shoulders to you, it's not gonna be as interesting if I'm like leaning one way or the other way. Now, when I move my shoulders either this way or that way, it's gonna do the same thing with my hips and it's going to change my balance on my legs. So it just puts a little bit of movement into the body and that's gonna translate into a little bit more of a dynamic pose. Now, when it comes to hands and feet, you want those looking pretty natural as well. Don't like, you know, stiffen them out or do something like this. You want those to be relatively natural, calm and loose and don't hide them. That's a weird thing. You know, like if I hide my hand like right over here, it's like, why is his hand back there? I would much rather be right here, even though this doesn't really make any sense. At least my hand is not hidden. When it comes to limbs like arms and legs, generally I try to have them not pointing directly towards the camera. All this information tends to kind of get lost in the photograph. Whereas I'm like doing this to the side, you can see very clearly what's going on with my arms. So it just makes the shape of my body a little bit more apparent. Now, if your subject is sitting down, if they're like crunched like this, it's not really going to look that great. So make sure their back is straight and they're standing tall and they're feeling confident and their tummy is engaged. That's just gonna give them a better posture and they're gonna feel a little bit more comfortable like this as well. Now, if your subject's standing up, oftentimes I'll have my subject stand just a little bit on their toes. It straightens them up a little bit, fixes their posture and tends to make them a little bit more sprightly, just tends to make those poses a little bit more dynamic. Another thing that can really help is to have your subject do something, give them something to interact with. It's relatively difficult to like look good, just like, hey, I'm just in front of this camera looking good. Now, if I have something to focus on, like I got a little phone here, it's a lot more natural. It's easier for me to like figure out what I'm doing and the photo is gonna come across a little bit more natural as well. The object doesn't have to be a phone or a football or whatever, it could be their clothing. You could say like, hey, button up and unbutton your shirt or well don't do that don't be a perv but you get the idea have them interact with something in the photo and that's going to be a little more natural don't be a perv am i a model now <laughs> and the last piece of advice is put a little bit of a twist in someone's body oftentimes what i'll have them do is if i'm pho photographing them straight on i'll actually point their feet to the side and have them look around like this just a little bit of twist adds some movement to the body and takes a little bit more see look at this now don't i look really great. The main things we're focusing on is a little bit of movement, not so static, and making sure everyone is nice and comfortable. 
Last question. What is the best way to organize your photo library? Any photo program you recommend? So my personal preference when it comes to organizing and cataloging my photos is Lightroom. Now Lightroom is a really powerful program. You can use it for raw processing. You can develop your photos with it, but it also does a really great job at organizing your images. I tend to organize my images by date and Lightroom will automatically do this for you. So when I import my photos from my computer or from my memory card, I choose a folder and have everything organized by year and day. Not only that, I'll tend to add the name of the photo shoot to that folder so I can get back to it at a glance. So once those photos are in Lightroom, you can add them to collections, which makes it easier to browse. For instance, if you photographed a wedding, you could make a collection for the rehearsal dinner. You'd simply select those images, click on create new collection and drag it right in there. Then you could do a new collection for day of or getting ready or the kiss or dang, she just slapped him in the face because she said he wasn't dancing real good or something like that. That's probably not going to be in your album, but you get the idea. That might be in the album. Yeah, now it's in the album. Now, when it comes to photo organization and editing, we just released a wonderful product called Photo Editing 101 through 301, which basically takes you the entire process of photography, importing, cataloging, working with Lightroom and Photoshop as well. So if you want to learn more in depth when it comes to photo editing, make sure to check out Photo Editing 101 through 301. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Some wonderful questions. Now, my question to you is about printing because it's a huge topic. So where do you get your images printed? How do you get your images printed? Do you have advice on getting your images printed? Do you have any horror stories about printing? Ooh. Do you have any beautiful stories about printing? Let us know in the comments down below. We can all learn together and share as a community. So now it's your turn to ask me a question. Simply leave your question in a comment right down below and if I choose you you get a free month of Florin Pro that's access to every single pro tutorial we've ever made it Lightroom presets Photoshop actions Photoshop brushes it's a wonderful 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 uh, it's just the best thing ever and all you have to do is leave a question right down below thanks so much for watching guys I can't wait to see your questions until next time I'll learn you later how does James Bond say hi I figure he doesn't say hi no James Bond does not say hi. Hi, James Bond. Hi. <laughs> Maybe hello, but not hi. If I read the script of a James Bond movie and he said hi, I'd, I'd say, take that word out. James Bond does not say hi.